Hey, my name is Marie Bush, and this is my wife, Cotenesa Bush. And we live in a 196 square foot tiny house in a tiny house community in the Dallas, Texas area. Yes. So, what was the catalyst for you to go tiny? Did you start out with a bigger house and then you eventually went down to the tiny house? Can you kind of touch base on how this all came about? Yes. Yeah, so, we've, um, since we've been married, we've always lived in apartments and we kind of decided to go tiny when we decided that we were going to start our debt free journey. And a few months into it, we thought, why are we paying money for an apartment that we don't own? And it's really expensive. It was really nice, but it was really expensive. So we thought, well, why not go tiny? And so it wasn't as easy as that because I actually took some convincing, <laughs> but now we are in it and we're loving it. So yeah, her biggest concern was having her kitchen. So I was like, yes. as long as we get you a nice kitchen, you're good to go. And she said, yeah. And so we have a, a very large kitchen in comparison to the rest of our house. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's kind of something that I see a lot with tiny homes is you can really create an amazing kitchen in a small space. And it almost seems like it's more functional because you don't have to, like if you have the, I think it's called the golden triangle with the stove, the sink, and the fridge, and you're able to put that together with nice aesthetics, it works out really well. What was the, uh, the catalyst to go debt-free? Because me personally, we were chatting a little bit before this started, I've, I'm debt-free for the first time in like seven years about two months ago. And for me, it was listening to, uh, to Dave Ramsey. Was there, was there any person that you were listening to or any catalyst in your life, like something happened, like, hey, we just need to be debt free, like kind of, how did that happen? And how did the, the tiny home idea come about? Because you mentioned you're paying rent. And, you know, there, there's pros and cons to that. But what was the catalyst to go tiny? Did you see a tiny home video? Did you know somebody that went tiny? So just to recap, what was the catalyst to go debt free and how did the tiny home come about as part of that plan? So um, we were also Dave Ramsey people and you know sh my wife had actually found him a lot sooner than I did really early in our marriage and it wasn't until we received a settlement of around nine thousand dollars which was a lot of money to us um, and we I was trying to figure out you know what should we do with this money do we save it do we invest it and that's when I started researching and came across Dave Ramsey's content um, and so I came home with what I thought was a bright new idea and she had actually been like, uh, duh, I've been talking about this for three years. Are you ready now? Oh, gosh. Um, and so once yeah. my light bulb went off, it kind of clicked for both of us. And then one of the first things we thought about, you know, was, man, if we're going to be downsizing and cutting this and cutting that out of our lives, but yet we're still here in this downtown apartment, um, really nice loft space, super, super nice, but also super expensive. It's like, how can we cut costs here as well? And so we had always wanted to, you know, sort of get away from renting, but we were still at a place in our life where we didn't just didn't know where we were going to settle down long term. So we were like, how do we get the ownership component while also still keeping the flexibility of renting? You know, you talked about the pros of renting. That's that's one of the big ones. And so um, the tiny house idea kind of popped into mind. And it was those two things, plus the thought of, you know, if we don't you know, want to do this long term, we can always you know, rent this out on Airbnb and, and kind of pivot if we need to do something different in the future. So um, those all kind of combo together is kind of what brought it. And I was just going to say a big part of like the tiny home idea was I was always watching HGTV. And so we would see lots of the tiny, a lot of the a tiny um, home tour video or shows on there. Um, there. There's probably like six or seven shows, tiny house related that we were watching all the time. And, and then finally, he brought the idea up and I was like, uh, I don't know. And then a few, I don't even think it's a very long, probably a couple months later, I was like, all right, let's just go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. Yeah. I feel like ours started more so with the the programs on, um, on the Roku that we were watching before we discovered really more of the YouTube channels. Mm -hmm. And then we started to discover some of the bigger um, tiny home YouTube channels, like tiny home tours, living big in a tiny house, exploring alternatives, things yeah. like that. And you know. um, from there, it was just like, oh, yeah, we can do this. Yeah, I mean, exploring alternatives and living big in a tiny house, their videos are absolutely amazing. They, they, they do a great job. Uh, when it comes down to the nuts and bolts of, you know, you stopped renting and you went into a tiny house, can you go deeper into what that transition was like in terms of the initial investment to get the tiny home and also downsizing? Because it, 
it, it definitely tells the story of, hey, we're renting and we got a tiny house, but I'd like to dive deeper into that to how that actually went. Was it more expensive than you thought to either build a tiny home or outfit it the way you wanted? And was it difficult to downsize to get into the tiny home? So when we first went, decided, we first started our debt-free journey in April of 2017, and um, we kind of were all gas and just throwing as much extra cash into, you know, all of our debt as possible. But then when we decided to go tiny, we ha actually had to put a halt on putting the debt towards the extra or putting the money towards the extra debt. And so we ended up um, deciding on a budget. We said we were going to not go over $55,000 and we made sure we were going to stick to that. So when we applied for the loan, that's the only, that's the amount that we asked to take out. We were like, we're not going to take out anymore. Yeah. This is what we're going to use. And that's it. And so we went ahead and we, once we got the loan, we were actually paying our rent on the apartment that we were um, living in still while they were building the tiny house. And then we were also repaying that loan back. So we ended up actually paying another payment. And so that, I don't think maybe, I don't know if I thought about that, but that was like, okay, we need to stop the debt-free journey, like for a little bit, stop putting all the extra money in there just so we can handle that. And then it took them four months to build a tiny house. And during that four months, we got rid of almost everything we owned. And I'll let him talk about that yeah. because that was like a part-time job for him, maybe yeah. full-time. And real quick before I get into that, um, the reason why it, it created a double payment was because the tiny house loan actually works more like a, per, a low interest personal loan than it does like a traditional mortgage. And so once we were approved, we were funded and literally $55,000 dropped into our bank account. Yep. <laughs> and so from there, we had the cash in hand and we paid our builders and I believe they required 50% up front and then it was 40% mm -hmm. once they hit the halfway mark and then the final 10% once, um, yeah, once the house was done and we took ownership of it. And so it, once the, once the money was funded and dropped into our bank account, you know, the yeah. bank wanted, you know, their payment back. And so that's kind of how we got into the double payment situation. So that's just something to think about. And then I would say with the selling and the downsizing of everything, it actually helped us on our debt-free journey. So yeah, that's true. a lot of the stuff we sold, we were just thinking about downsizing to, to fit into mm -hmm. the tiny house more so than we were thinking about all the proceeds we would make off of the sale of all of our property. And so that was even a bigger boost. And we we're like, oh, wow, like this is actually helping. And we got pretty good money for everything, mm -hmm. um, you know, that we sold off. Yeah. Uh, Dave Ramsey talks about being gazelle intense. So it's uh, selling things, downsizing your car, getting side hustles. Uh, speaking of the side hustles and also the how, how you paid for this, um, part, part of Dave Ramsey's thing, it sounds like a Dave Ramsey commercial almost, but pr I promise he's not sponsoring this. Uh, but part of it is increasing your income and then getting into things that you can't really, uh, that, that you don't really need that, that are expensive. You know, like I was, I went on a run before this podcast, was listening to his pod, his podcast and somebody said they had $19,000 in a car and he's like, sell that thing and get a $5,000 cash car. Like you're paying X amount of dollars. And the reason why I bring that up is, did you do any of that in your debt-free uh, dream? Like what were you working for? Did you downsize cars? Did you pick up side hustles? Or did you have, you know, you just stayed with your regular income and just downsized your spending? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it first started with us just doing, like we're just gonna get on a budget and see how much we're just throwing away. And, which ended up being a lot. But when we sat down and we like mapped out to see when we would be debt free, the debt free time, like when we were supposed to be debt free wasn't until like mid 2021. And I was like, there's no way I am going to be doing this lifestyle for another three years. There's no way I'm doing that. So in my mind, I'm just like, I need to figure out what's the best way to make as much money as possible. And so we had both of our um, full time jobs and then we both ended up probably together we at one time we had like six jobs so we started off small and just picking up different side hustles and then um we were trying to just max it out and then later on we, we figured out when would be the how we could make the most money the most efficiently so i was serving um coaching lifeguarding and teaching um and then he was doing some like delivery some pizza delivery he did ups for a little bit he did um like he was working at the restaurant with me for a little bit so we were doing as much as possible for as long as possible until we got out of debt. we were able to cut that time down from 2021 to 2019 so that was 
good enough for me. Yeah, and we actually probably fell in that category of people that Dave would normally tell to sell their cars because yeah. we actually bought two brand new cars before we kind of had this epiphany. Um, so mine was a brand new 2014. It was like a $20,000 car. Hers was a brand new 2016, mm -hmm. which was a, like an $18,000 car. But by the time we started on our debt-free journey, we had already paid so much off of them. And then also we had already lost so much value. And when, I, when we ran the values through Kelly Blue Book, it was like, man, if the money's gone, like it's already gone. Yeah. So it's like at this point, let's just bust through this, pay these off as fast as possible and just enjoy having like nicer, newer cars that are paid for mm -hmm. versus like selling them, you know, we're going to take the hit either way. So it's like anything we lost is already lost. Let's just get them paid off and, and just not do it again in the future. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I had no idea how much uh, depreciation was on vehicles because after college, I was traveling around. I just got little beater cars, you know, three or four thousand dollar cars. And uh, for for my bus, I tow a Honda Element and it's a 2006, but it had like uh, low miles on it. So just like I'm, I'm right in the same boat as you. I'd rather invest in a, in a car, spend that money than have to continuously throw money at it to try and keep it on the road. So when it, when it comes down to being in the tiny house and downsizing, how much has that assisted you with saving money? Because I know in my bus, for example, I calculated my monthly expenses to, to live. That is everything from my Spotify account to my health insurance to diesel to an extra $150, $200 per month as a backup you know, repair fund if anything happens to the bus. And it's around $1,200, $1,300 a month. And that's all in that's that's all my expenses have you found something similar living in the tiny house do you feel as though it's saving you a lot of money uh can you kind of touch base on that yeah so um we've kind of found that number more recently with coronavirus we had a certain budget that we were living on but it wasn't by any means super strict like it was when we were getting out of debt and uh, once the pandemic took over we kind of had to go back and revisit you know because we didn't know what was next or what was to come and so we scrapped it all the way down to not, I won't even say the bare essentials because there's still some things in there yeah. that could be cut out like internet um, and like a Netflix account and things like that. But um, going down to almost the bare minimums, mm -hmm. ours is around $2,100 yeah. per month, which yeah. is significantly less than what it was yeah. before we went tiny. We would typically mm -hmm. run on about four grand a month, um, you know, before going tiny at all. And that, that adds up quick. It absolutely adds up quick. That, that kind of shifts gear into another area that I wanted to touch base on, unless you wanted to touch base on going debt-free. Is there anything else that you wanted to cover on that before I shift gears to finding places to park? No, I think we got it. Okay. Uh, the, the next part, the, most, the second most common question I get is, how do you find land to park your tiny homes? Because as you well know, I'm sure you found in your research, it might be different in Texas, but a lot of people run into issues where they will – want to go tiny, but they have no place to park their rig. There, there's no tiny home villages or there's ordinances in their hometown to where you can't have a tiny home on wheels or you can, but it has to be on a foundation. There's just a bunch of stuff that goes along with it. Can you touch base on what your research was like finding a place to park and how difficult it was for you to find a place? Yeah, so when we first went tiny, we kind of just were jumping head first and didn't really, we just thought we'll get the house and we'll figure out where we're going to live later. So we kind of knew that we could live in an RV park. And so that was just the, this is going to be temporary. We'll get in there. And when we lived in Florida, we lived in a, we moved into the RV park and we started doing our search to looking for different places. There were no communities that were close enough in Florida where we were living. And then we ran into the thing of, okay, if you're in this certain area, you can't park in someone's backyard because of the city ordinances and things like that. And so then when you go way out where it is permitted, we ran into the, the trouble of having people, they didn't have all the hookups and things like that. So it became a lot, we should have done a lot more research before we went in. It became a lot more of a headache than we realized. But when we were deciding if we were gonna move to Texas or not, we were actually seeing, okay, well, let's see if there's actually communities there. And we, um, I think via Facebook or something like that, we ended up running into like Terry and he was starting the community here. And that was like three years ago now, two yeah. years ago now. It was a um, long project for him. Yeah. And so we were like, okay, well this time next year we might want to move there. And so he was like, yeah, we think the community is going to be ready by then. And so literally we were just following along with him um, for when it got done. So there was lots of city hall meetings, lots of planning, lots of 
a lot of planning that went into it. Um, and so finally we decided before it got completed, um, we moved to Texas in April of last year. And then we ended up moving to the community in October um, because it was still in the process of being built and everything being approved and things like that. So, Yeah, and in terms of like what we actually do to find the spot every time we move, usually it, it literally starts with a Google search. So yep. we were thinking about how do we get back to Kansas, get back closer to family, which is Kansas City, Missouri, but also still stay in the South where it's relatively warm. And then we just landed on Dallas and we're like, okay. And so I typed in tiny house community, tiny house village in Dallas. And I started going through all these different things and there was nothing really there. Yeah. But then eventually we saw, you know, this community and, and the, the information about it being in the works and just kind of followed it up. And that's mm -hmm. what kind of led to what she was discussing there. So it is different and it is tough. We've been in a tiny house for three years now and it's not like we just have some map or yeah. or anything like that that just tells us where they're all at it's literally just getting online and, yeah. and just starting to kind of dig in and and, and and find out and we kind of make a little mental notes of communities that we learn about like we know about one in california so when we think about you know if we ever ended up out there there's something we already have in the back of our mind we've heard about you know the village in durango colorado so if we were ever there then so we kind of we make little mental notes of mm -hmm. where they're at but um, if, if we're looking for something specific, we'll just kind of search it up and, and see what we can find yeah. when the time comes. Yeah, Allison, uh, she's a team member on Tiny Home Tours. Uh, she's based out of uh, Durango. And okay. She, she loves it there. In terms of the communities, how is it living in a tiny home community? Do you feel as though you have some some camaraderie with other tiny home dwellers? You guys kind of have similar stories? Like, what what's that like and how much does it actually cost to live in a tiny home village because i'm guessing you're renting the piece of land or do you buy the piece of land so we're renting um our land and it's 500 for this side of the village and the other side because it's larger it's 550 and that includes um your water sewer trash um there's a washeteria on site there's like um a little fire um bonfire area things like that and in the future there's going to be a community center um there's a house on the property that he'll end up turning into a community center so all those things are included in that um but it, it's actually nothing like we've ever experienced before when we moved here we were like okay like this is cool we're in a tiny house village um and we were like pretty early on before a lot of the houses got there and so the more houses are coming to the village the more it feels like wow this is like a little community and it's like a little like it almost feels I keep I always say this it feels like back in college you're like in a little area with all your friends and you're like hey y'all want to go like hang out tonight at the bonfire or y'all want to do this and so it's pretty cool we have like movie nights on the weekends and we have like bonfires and things like that so it's a pretty close-knit community yeah the movie nights are outside because I don't think we could all fit in <laughs> any one of the houses but um, there is a larger house on property that's also owned by the same owner of this village. And there's a big blank white wall on the back side of it. And we uh, take the projector out there yeah. and, and watch movies up on it. And we also have a little group chat. So we all pretty much stay in communication. Yep. Lately, it's been trying to keep random people off uh, the property. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, people will come up and always be a little too nosy, a yeah. little too pushy. It's a little intrusive um, sometimes. Like, hey, random on the property. And somebody will go out there and tell them, you know, where to find more information and yeah. stuff like that. And that, it's just people like, hey, I didn't know this village is here. And they're just coming to check out the houses and that yeah. type of thing. Is that, is that what happening? Yeah. Some of it is that. Some of it is people that like have seen it on the internet and they're like, oh, I'm just going to come by and see what it's about. And they like come knock on doors and say, hey, can I come take a tour? And we're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes honestly it feels like we're in a in a in a zoo exhibit or something, yeah. you know? Cars driving by slowly and people are sticking phones out the yep. window and <laughs> all like literally on the weekends all day. Um cars in and out, in and out, in and out. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So you mentioned the move from Florida to Texas. And when it comes down to to income are you internet based income or do you move to a new city and find new jobs or do you have an existing job that has branches everywhere that you're able to move like what what's that actually like moving around and having having income because for for me i in, in my bus i travel around a lot more so it's basically non-stop travel but it sounds as though you you all have kind of a plan to be somewhere for two or three years and then the possibility of moving on how do you manage that with your income 
Yeah, so for me, I work for a national retail brand. So we have stores all over the country. So the transfer is pretty simple and pretty easy. And for me, I, um, I was teaching in Florida, but I'm not teaching here in Texas. But because one of my side jobs was serving, like you can get a serving job anywhere. So it's pretty easy there. I just right now I'm, am wanting to be more settled before I go back into teaching because I just prefer to be somewhere for like a longer period of time teaching than to be moving around. So when we decide where we're going to settle down, then I'm going to jump back into it. Yeah, when you mentioned teaching, it's not necessarily in a school setting. It's more of freelance private lessons or how? how do no, you... I was teaching. I was teaching 10th grade math in um, in Jacksonville, or in Florida. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, that definitely makes sense because you want to build up that rapport in that particular district, get to know the other teachers. And I mean, the, the serving thing, I know multiple people on the road that will work in, you know, Dif <clears throat> excuse me, different uh, tourist seasons, be able to be somewhere for two or three months. In my very first van, I was traveling through Florida and just happened to be spring break. So I spent a month and a half there and, you know, drove off with $7,000 extra cash after, you know, a month and a half. I basically all my 20s was serving, bartending, bar backing, just bouncing from city to city, traveling around. It's it's a great income, quick cash. And yep. once you have the skill set, if you're able to know the ins and out of the business, it's very, very easy. Yep. Uh, anything else for someone that's watching this that, you know, they, they're dreaming of going tiny and they're the people that really want to do it. And I'd say about of the people watching this, I'd say 20% are the ones in their zone right now where they might actually be able to pull off this lifestyle. Uh, do you have any advice for them or any words of motivation for them to look into the lifestyle, whether it be renting a tiny home for a week and see what they think or how to save up for it? Just any, any insights you'd like to share? Yeah, I would just say the more you can design the home around your lifestyle, the less of a transition it feels mm -hmm. like. So if you're afraid that, man, am I going to hate this? Just <clears throat> build in when you have it built or if you build it yourself, you know, build in the things that are the most important to you and the things that you do daily. Um, the less routines you have to change, the more natural of a transition it feels like. And so we, we focused on what was most important and the other stuff, you realize how flexible you really are. Yeah. I mean, and I would just say, if you are really afraid, there are so many tiny homes that are now like doing the whole Airbnb thing. Just go check it out. Um, especially because we don't have any experience with kids, but especially with the people that like have families, we do have a, a few families with children in our community, but some people are like, that would not work. I cannot do it. So I would say, you know, take your family and go there for a week and see how it is. And if you don't think that it's going to be for you, then, you know, then, you know, yeah, absolutely. Well, if anybody wanted to catch up with you, give you a shout on social, how can someone reach you guys and what would be the best way for them to for them to get a hold of you? Yeah, so we actually have our own YouTube channel as well. It's called Living Tiny with the Bushes. That's B-U-S-H-E-S. -S. Um, and then we're also on Instagram where they can send us a DM at Tiny House Lifestyle with an underscore in between each word. So tiny underscore house underscore lifestyle on Instagram. <laughs> and if you're watching this, it'll be in the description of the video. If you're listening to it, it's going to be in the show notes. I appreciate your time. Thanks for taking the time to uh, talk to me today. And yeah, thanks for being on. Thank you. We Thanks appreciate for it. Us.